At the top of the show, we spelled out the latest developments in the impeachment inquiry, plus some of the attacks against the witnesses giving damaging testimony. Now, in this segment, we're going to speak with someone who has been through something like this before. It's a limited universe, but obviously what happened with Richard Nixon, very appropriate and applicable now. My next guest, one of the 17 Watergate prosecutors who penned a piece in the Washington Post saying that Trump should be impeached. Richard Davis joins me now. He's also former assistant secretary of the Treasury. And I went back and read that. That was three weeks ago, Richard, and it's amazing. That's like 30 years in uh, dog's eyes, whatever, as it relates to this probe. I can only imagine, not that there was any uncertainty when you wrote that, but in the three weeks, it's only had to amplify your belief that an impeachable offense occurred. There's no question. As each day takes place, more witnesses testify. And obviously, we've had now some very direct testimony from Ambassador Taylor, which really demonstrates that when we wrote then was right then, and it's even more right now. Talk about some of the testimony you've heard uh, from both Taylor, uh, also what we saw yesterday with Colonel Vonlin. To me, at least from the layperson, Richard, forget about confirming what the whistleblower said. Now we know that people immediately knew there was major problems on that conversation. They said as much, and also they went to lengths to hide the contents of it, and that it went up the food chain, that immediately they articulated, listen, we're not comfortable with what was said here for all the geopolitical reasons and other, and people now are distancing themselves that reportedly were part of those conversations from the beginning. Well, I think what is very interesting about Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's testimony from yesterday, you got the reaction from somebody who is dedicated his life and his career to serving the country. He's been a military man. He's been in combat on behalf of this country. And when he heard what was being said on that call, he was horrified. He saw it as an abuse of power, and he reported it. And that's the kind of human reaction. So when somebody says, like the president, oh, this was a perfect call, this is how somebody who really cares about the country reacts. Obviously, Ambassador Taylor, you know, also a Vietnam veteran and somebody who served his country for decades, you know, was very clear that being told that it was a quid pro quo. So the evidence is piling up. And I think that, you know, what, you know, the president and others say, these people are part of some deep state. These are the people who are dedicated public servants and this is how they react, this is what they saw, and they were horrified about what they were seeing. To me, I thought it was very instructive that when uh, the colonel raised his concerns um, to John Bolton, Bolton, in effect, said, create a paper trail here. Make sure, because this thing sounds to me like a drug deal or whatever his analogy that he drew there was, um, not only did they share the concerns, but they made sure that people knew up and down the line that don't put my fingerprints on this. We're not comfortable with this. He also shut down reportedly, did Bolton, uh, Ambassador Sunland, where he said, no, 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 where you're going is quick, quick, whoa, this meeting's over. I assume we're going to hear from Bolton. And to this point, is he one of the most interesting witnesses you'd be in terms of his testimony? He would be a very interesting witness now, whether he will turn out to actually be willing to appear uh, given the instruction not to testify that will come from the White House, is not certain. But he would be a very dramatic witness in the sense that he plainly is not part of any deep state. <laughs> He's plainly not somebody who you could say is uh, somebody who's a Democratic favorite. He's the exact opposite. But these are somebody who, according to the testimony, saw what was going on and analogized this, as you said, to a drug deal. He saw it was wrong. He saw it was criminal. And he wanted to stay away from it. So I think he would be, if he testifies, a very critical witness. And we have, again, from Fiona Hill, we have some of his reaction already on the record. Who else uh, have you not heard from that you really would like to? Because all of a sudden, some figures in the last couple of days that we were told had no role in this, all of a sudden, from Pence's office, uh, you have Perry from Energy, all of a sudden, they may not have been as immunized from this conversation as we were originally led to believe. I mean, I think all of those witnesses, I think Secretary Perry, uh, Vice President Pence, but m probably more importantly, Secretary Pompeo. I think he would be a very important witness to hear, both in terms of how he defends what he did to Ambassador Yovanovitch, in terms of abruptly removing her, for, uh, and what he did in connection with he knew about the Giuliani efforts. 
Um, and he's somebody who's in an interesting position. He's both a loyalist to the president, but he's somebody with his own personal political ambitions, whether it be to run for the Senate in Kansas or something else. So how he would play and what he would say and whether he's prepared really to come clean on this would be, I think, very interesting. What do you think the articles of impeachment would be? What would they look like? The last time we spoke, you said, you know, both treason and bribery don't seem to fit here, but high crimes and misdemeanors do, and there was a broad application of it. To me, this screams of obstruction of justice. What else? Well, look, I, I would focus this on the clear abuse of power. This was an extraordinary abuse of power. Think of it this way. He's in the, in the conversation with the president of a beleaguered country who desperately needs military help. He's, he said, he's told, we're going to ask for that military help. And he says, no, well, could you just help me by get, you know, doing an investigation of this company? And could you look back in the 2016 election? Think of if he had said, um, gee, yeah, that's interesting that you want that. Would you give a million dollars to my political campaign? Well, I would suggest that the value to his political campaign of what he was asking for was every bit as valuable. So I would focus on the abuse of power. I would use information from the Mueller investigation that showed that he traditionally in his campaign had been willing to accept foreign help. Uh, indeed, they were eager for it in the Trump Tower meeting. But I would focus it on these events uh, because I think they are easily explainable. I think the witnesses are incredibly impressive. Um, I think that while people may attack them because that's the nature of the game, I think if you see Ambassador Taylor in public, you see Lieutenant Colonel Vindman in public, that will be very important in helping to sustain public support, which I think is critical to any impeachment effort. Okay, tomorrow um, the House um, is going to, in an attempt for some transparency and also answer some of the, the political criticisms they received, uh, going to attempt to bring some sunlight, as they say, is the best disinfectant to this. The process is also important here, isn't it, Richard? I explain how instead of where we're used to the five minute perorations that these lawmakers will go on and somebody will go on a completely different tangent five minutes later, there'll be the ping pong in between the political parties. There's going to be a structure, as I understand it, that's going to lend itself much more to a coherent narrative for the most important audience, which is the American public at the end of the day. Explain how that'll work, who'll do the questioning, and at least is my understanding how this is going to be more professional than some of these hearings we've seen in the past. I mean, I think that what you're going to see is questioning by the chair of the committee. Uh, you're going to see some questioning by s staff, and that's very important uh, to bring out the facts. Because as you suggested, too often if you have congressional hearings, and I personally have testified when I was in Treasury in many of them, you know, it's a, you know, a, di you know, a dialogue or a monologue, actually, by the questioner, and he puts a question mark at the end. So I think that you're going to be, uh, have much more pointed questions. I think you'll have opening statements that will be precise and clear. And I do think that, you know, while they, it was appropriate to conduct this preliminary investigation the way they did, it is valuable now to have this in a very clear way presented, which is what happened in Watergate. In Watergate, the House Impeachment Committee really conducted most of its investigation in private, but then, you know, presented publicly what they had so the public would clearly understand what the evidence was and what was at stake. Finally, Richard, we're going to look back this week, do you believe, as a turning point of sorts where even if politically people's formal positions on impeachment may not have changed, it made it harder and harder um, to try and label this as some witch hunt or whatever, given the credibility of some of the folks that came before the basically these closed door committees. I, I think that's true. And I think, look, I'm not naive. I mean, uh, I would like to think that the Republican senators uh, who are listening to this as it evolves would do what happened in 1974 when Barry Goldwater led a group of people over to the White House to say it's over. I, I don't really expect that to happen. But I'd like to see some of them recognize publicly that they owe it to the country to really look at this in the way the evidence really supports and that there was an extraordinary abuse of power. And I think that if this is handled appropriately publicly, I think there'll be good public support for this, whatever the Senate decides. Richard Davis, uh, really helpful tonight. I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
All right, everyone, when we come back, uh, we're going to stay in the legal lane here. We'll bring our panel in. We're going to start with an interesting debate. Where is the line between free speech and a crime? Two UConn students, they're testing that line after getting arrested for yelling a racial slur while walking through a parking lot. I'm going to tell you what happened next.